Welcome back, everyone. I know you're more than ready to enjoy the lectures of some eminent experts from different parts of the globe. So let's just jump right into the first lecture titled Exploring City Nightscapes, a Global Perspective. And the lecture will be given by Mark Burton Page, General Director of Lucy. And this pre-recorded lecture will be followed by a Q&A session on Zoom. So if you have any questions or comments regarding the lecture, feel free to leave a comment during the lecture on the YouTube uh, live streaming channel, or you could ask Mark directly in the Q&A session by pressing the hand up emoji, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, here is Lucy General Director Mark Burton Page. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, hello again. I'm Mark Burton Page from Lucy. I'm really glad to be with you again this morning. Thank you all for watching from uh, your office or from home or from Seoul. As you know, urban lighting is a public policy that has a massive impact on the lives of urban dwellers. And that is half of the world population, something around 4 billion human beings now are living in cities. Our main area of work in lighting is the nighttime. So that is exactly 50% of our total living time, around 350,000 hours for each of us. The main driver behind Lucy is about using light as a tool to drive sustainable development of cities. And I'll explain more in a minute. During this talk, I'll take you to a number of cities and along the way, we'll talk about their common challenges and opportunities. I will start by saying that in Lucy, we've always wanted to dig deeper into the questions linked to the governance of city nightscapes. Why are things lit in the way they are? Who is doing what? And how are decisions taken that lead to a specific circumstance occurring. Every city of the world has public lighting in one way or another. Cities have been using light in a variety of ways, leading to very different luminous landscapes or nightscapes. Here is Rotterdam, one of the largest ports in Europe. Of course, bridges and water are often a core component of nightscapes. The nightscape impacts how we move through cities and what we see as we move through the city. Certainly, light is essential for the functioning of a city after dark. How cities apply light in their urban spaces goes a long way towards shaping these spaces and our experience of the city as a whole. Here is Strasbourg in France, one of the seats of the European Parliament. You have a very nice use of lighting to reveal character of these great historic buildings. Light is eminently political. And of course, we don't mean that in a bad way. Lighting is political because it has a link to safety and security, a key concern for most local communities, but also because of the symbolic aspect of light. When we choose to highlight something, or on the contrary, to really keep it hidden from view. Here in Lyon, when this building that was once a hospital was founded in the 12th century, it was first lit at the end of uh, 1989. And it's been relit in 2019, 30 years after. And it has now been reinvented as a building for mixed uses, including a garden, a hotel, a museum, shops, etc. The city really wanted to mark its Renaissance. Indeed, in many cities, Nightscapes are a construct. They vary from city to city, are based on different political choices, budgets, legal environment, cultures, values. They depend on the women and the men that are leading the urban lighting of a city. This includes a mix of actors from the municipality itself to the private sector, utilities, power authorities. Here, I take you to Yvaskala. Central Finland. The actual president of Lucy 
it's up north where it gets much darker half of the year. This obviously inspired the city to come up with a full city of light strategy that includes having a lighting designer on the prey roll, putting up a major light festival, etc. While the impacts of nightlife and the weight of nighttime economy are increasingly recognized today, the importance of the city nightscape in itself is perhaps less evident. The nightscape really falls within the realm of the intangible, with very broad consequences that go over the direct economic and social impacts. Here we are in Antwerp, where light really helps to underline the symbolic importance of buildings. You have the cathedral on the backdrop, you also have the Grote Mark and the statue in the front. You can almost feel the vibrancy of the nightlife there. City nightscapes also evolve over time. They grow and they mature. Different cities are, of course, at different stages of this evolution. Some relatively young nightscapes start by focusing on a specific neighborhood in the city and others with a um, vast dimension compile over two or three working generations. They will encompass the city and have far-reaching implications. In Lyon, they are now laying the foundation for the third generation of light plan. The ambition is to be cross-sectorial in the approach to light and to night. Here you can see London City, the square mile at the core of London with their lighting strategy that's been totally redesigned and implemented since 2018. This is the first such strategic approach to lighting in the whole of London and this has attracted lots of attention worldwide. That's why at Lucy we initiated the process for this book um, with the help of the city of Lyon, also with funding from the European Union, inside a research project called ROC. With this publication, we wanted to explore um, the different approaches to developing city nightscapes, serve as a source of inspiration. And you can download that book for free on our website, and we'll be publishing the link for that in a moment. Since we published it, it's been downloaded nearly 400 times. So we spoke to 12 cities in Europe, but also outside. Especially we added Seoul and Shanghai for perspectives from cities in Asia. These very rich conversations with public lighting decision makers, people who are engineers, designers, elected officials, have brought to light common challenges in cities and raise some critical questions that policymakers will need to navigate in the near future. Five common challenges stood out. Number one, we need to bring about a mind shift as we think about urban lighting of the future. Urban lighting goes beyond the functional element. And of course, it is a functional element. It's really essential for visibility, for security, for energy and cost savings for better management and control with added smartness. But lighting is also more and more about recognizing the benefits for the emotional part of the city. The identity, the attractiveness, the beauty, even the poetry of a city. And it can enable deeper, richer conversations about how we design our urban fabric at night. Number two, evolving the technology, but not for it. Actually, technology as a tool. How can cities take advantage of a rapidly changing technologies without letting these technologies really determine their vision, their long-term vision? That's quite a common question that we had for our interviewed experts. Cities have spoken of lighting master plans that can be really interesting tools in this effort to be future-proof. And a few have mentioned the importance of identifying and creating a strong nightscape vision, or even a lighting style, a signature for the city that will withstand the test of time. For that, we need to build better alliances between art and science, between the engineer and the designer, technical and social, and I will come back to that in a moment. 
and that alliance is the key to a better balance. Number three, engaging and connecting with citizens. Some cities point out how it's really hard to really engage with citizens on urban lighting and go further than the need for more light, the need for less light questions. Indeed, there are some technical aspects to lighting and it's not easy to speak the same language. I think this can be addressed in the long term, but it does require quite a strong commitment. And at Lucy, we see a few examples where cities are reaching out to citizens, to the community, and actually building a dialogue. And this leads me to challenge number four. Several cities suggest that a key to developing a better dialogue will really be to raise awareness about the way the city is lit at night, to better explain the value, the quality of light, and the identity of the city at night. This should be targeted to all the producers of light in the city, not only towards citizens, but also commercial developments, building owners, etc. The aim is really to grow a culture of light in the city. And some cities like Lyon or Yevaskala have currently working on creating simple layman versions of their city lighting policies and master plans. Indeed, they insist that it's very important to improve communication with stakeholders in the city, better communication about their work on urban lighting, better communication on the positive impacts of a quality nightscape, and better communication to engage people in creating and maintaining their nightscape. In fact, lighting is really everyone's affair. Working together with the community, building public-private partnerships can improve the nightscape, making it more than the sum of its parts. Number five, a delicate balancing act. In the end, the nightscape is the result of a series of compromises between the points you see in this slide and, and more. Decision makers have told us that they really have to find a balance between responding to security goals and lighting norms, adding light, to highlight identity and culture versus avoiding overlighting and remaining on track for energy efficiency and sustainability goals. Also, balance between the many sources of light. How can cities coordinate the many layers, the private layers, including, for example, luminous advertisements and public layers of light that really both make up the urban nightscape? So these are some of the common challenges that emerged from the conversations on nightscapes that we had with the cities that are featured in the book. We don't have time to go in detail now, but I really invite you to download this book and read the, the individual city interviews in it. All those challenges and questions bring me to the last part of this presentation about what is next for urban lighting. So new approaches to lighting that are based on new lighting technology are really fantastic, not only for um, lower energy consumption, for curbing energy budgets, but also to tackle some excessive lighting. In itself, these techniques that especially enable cities to lower lighting levels constitute a real game changer. As I said many times, a paradigm shift in the urban lighting field. Because today, cities can really better adapt lighting to where and when it's needed. However, this is still a work in progress. In order to go further, to deploy systems at a larger scale and achieve impact, we need to ask the right questions for it to be acceptable, societally acceptable for everybody. And we need to start with the why. This is why Lucy is publishing very soon a document called a city's guide to smart lighting. We really wanted a guide from cities for cities. So we had a collective approach to this publication and we had many co-creation meetings with cities that contributed in full to the document itself. You can see here one of the online whiteboards that we used during one of the meetings. A lot of great ideas. In the end, this paper brings together two different approaches for smart lighting that tend to be treated separately. A technical and operational approach aiming for efficiency in the city, lots of energy saving, etc. 
and a social societal approach for example light for well-being social implications of lighting lighting for identity the qualitative part of lighting Based on those both frameworks, the paper is really about the question, why smart lighting? And it really discusses how smart lighting can contribute to a broad range of topics. Environmental sustainability, social sustainability, citizen value, and the city's internal organization, for example, and more. It also focuses on the how-to, and it gives some guides for action for cities, based on the advice and the experiences of other cities. We come back on things like building a case for smart lighting, organizing the right expertise, conducting a pilot, engaging with citizens, ensuring interoperability, tendering, data management. So overall, with all these conversations and discussions with cities, we can see that going a further step in sustainability in the sense of smart and societal added value in public lighting brings up challenges. There are a lot of unexplored avenues. And what I want to tell you right now, and we see this in the Lucy network, is that exchange and peer-to-peer -peer dialogue is badly needed by the cities. We need to work together, we need cooperation to connect and exchange about common challenges and opportunities, and that is what we're doing in Lucy. If you can stay until tomorrow during the wrap up and closing of this workshop, I will tell you in more detail what you can do today to um, join this fantastic corporation of cities that is Lucy. For the moment, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. And I will be joining you live in Seoul for the Q&A. Thank you so much for your attention. And don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So that was our first lecture. And Mark, are you ready for the Q&A? Absolutely. Great. So we got first question for you. As cities have become overcrowded and people increasingly value their time after the sunset, lighting in urban open spaces is becoming more and more important. And considering that the COVID-19 pandemic has driven up time spent outside compared to inside, is it reasonable to transition to social lighting for open spaces from urban light that is mainly based on the level of brightness? I'm not sure I see a question in here, <laughs> um, but thank you for, for asking in any case. Um, I think, you know, after this pandemic, a lot of people are now uh, wanting to go outside, um, are wanting to meet each other again. So uh, efforts from cities to reconnect, to build back uh, these um, these uh, connections between people after dark is very important. Um, however, of course, we also see a major challenge and actually a major trend in a lot of cities. Um, remember, we don't see all the cities, we see a lot of cities, but uh, we actually see this trend of, yes, lowering lighting levels in some places, especially where uh, people are sleeping or people are not using the public space uh, all night. Uh, we're not talking about um, cities actually taking off the light totally, um, but in some places there are um, lowering lighting levels that are made possible uh, by technology or by um, a better understanding of the use of uh, where light is needed or not. Um, and of course, this is not totally possible in areas where uh, the city is much used. And we will see more and more uh, city is used by night. Um, but we need to do this in a sensible way. We need to do this in a human way. So the technology goes together with, uh, with how we perceive the, the use of the public space and the, use, the societal use of the public space at night, even after this, this pandemic landscape. OK. <laughs> Thank you. And we have 
one question just came in. Okay. So Mark, how can the city administration find and um, gauge where and when the light is needed? Yeah, so I was touching upon this, but it's true we can go in much more detail. A lot of the, um, and, and you know, this is not really the place to do this. It's, uh, uh, we, we, can, we can do this in further also workshops, etc. And, and perhaps in, in smaller groups, you can also um, read some of the publications that we've, uh, we've just put up. I didn't talk about this in the, in the presentation right now, but you can also download on our website one of our magazines, for example. Um, it's um, on smart lighting, and it, it, it gives a lot of details on um, some experimentations at the moment. And of course, one of the answers to your question is definitely um, to use the technology in the right way. So lighting has always been um, both a science and an art. So you have a lot of engineers and a lot of designers, for example, and if they work together um, to use the technology in a right way for uh, society, um, then you can you can find avenues for better um, better adapting uh, the lighting for the city. And for example, in some projects that we are seeing at the moment, they use sensors, they use presence detectors, they use movement detectors. I mean, a lot of um, sensors can be used for that. But also, you can use, um, I would say, some. Um, photography from satellites or from planes that you can fly by your city to see exactly where the lighting is. And for example, um, we see a lot of practices at the moment where um, we see that some private lights are very bright. So it's not only the city lighting, it's also some lights from other uh, stakeholders that are uh, there um, in the very center of the city and that are very important. and you can also enter a dialogue with these private stakeholders to make sure that uh, lights can be where they are needed um, and for the right place, the right time, and for the right people. Okay. Just a few examples. <laughs> Thank you for the detailed answer. All right. Um, if you have any more questions, this is your chance, our online participants. I'm here. <laughs> Okay. And I'm here for the two days, so don't hesitate if you do have more questions. Mm. Uh, I That's can also true. answer later. You can also ask it later. That's true. All right. <laughs> so we'll wrap up lecture one here. So thank you so much, um, Mark, and we'll see you later. Thank again. you so much. All right.